Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Sarah McFarland. I'm the head of the Department of Language and Communication, and it is my honor this evening to introduce um, Jude Sutherland Kessler, who is our presenter tonight. Uh, she's a graduate of NSU with two degrees in English and History, which she managed to complete in record time and with an excellent GPA. Um, and she's a native of Natchitoches. Her family is here. But more importantly for us tonight, I suppose, is that she's the author of Should Have Been There and Shivering Inside, which are the first two volumes in her planned nine-volume set of historical novels on the life of John Lennon that are based on more than 20 years of her extensive ex research, including multiple trips to Liverpool to interview the family, friends, and acquaintances of John Lennon and the Beatles. Unlike some other historical fiction, each of Miss Kessler's novels features hundreds of mesmerizing <coughs> footnotes and chapter notes that indicate which parts are fact and which parts are speculation. Reviewers of these books have likened the experience to being a fly on the wall in the truest sense of that phrase in John Lennon's life, being able to watch each un event unfold with the kind of color and real life elements that less detailed and more academic biographies don't even attempt. Tonight's presentation is titled All I Know I Learned from NSU and the Beatles. Please give me, please join me in giving Ms. Kessler a warm welcome back to NSU. Take turns, 
eat your lunch, share your toys, say please and thank you. I was always fascinated by that poster. And I wondered if I wrote my own poster about where I learned everything I know, how I would write it, and what it would say. And I think my poster would be written in psychedelic, scented magic markers. <laughs> and every eye would have a heart above the eye. And it would say, everything I know, I learned at NSU and from the Beatles. Now you're thinking, good grief, she went all the way to college without learning anything? That's pretty sad. But you know what? I came to NSU at a very, very early age. When I came to NSU, I was only 16 years old. I was a high school student, a conservative, goody-goody, student body president kind of girl in an era when radicalism and protest and even bomb threats reigned on the NSU campus. Now I know you're thinking, oh sure, 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 but no. This was the era when there was a young man on campus named Robert Fleege. Robert Fleege had multiple piercings, wore the American flag as a belt, carried the greening of America and Betty Friedan's feminine manifesto under one arm and peace protest uh, posters under the other arm. I was absolutely terrified of it. <laughs> but I didn't let Mr. Fleege take up that much of my imagination because I had come to NSU to work. You see, I was going to high school in the mornings and then going to college in the afternoons. My parents had always felt that the best way to spend every summer was going to summer school. So from the sixth grade on, I had taken high school courses. And by the time I got to my senior year in high school, I had taken everything there was to take in high school, except for my fourth year English class and my fourth year PE class. So instead of wasting my time with electives or study halls, they came up with a great idea that I could get my own Head Start program going by head starting right into college half day. And it's a good thing that they decided that because the very first class that I took here at Northwestern was with Dr. William Allen Poe, and it was a world history class. Dr. Poe was not just a good teacher and not just a great teacher, he was a fascinating teacher. He made history come alive. He made it now, present, here, today. And so I decided that I could not follow through with my original plan of getting an English degree, that I had to get not only an English degree, but I needed a history degree as well. Because I could see that if I ever wanted to fulfill what I wanted to do, which was write a researched, documented, footnoted historical novel on the life of some outstanding person, then I needed to do it by being both a history major and an English major. So I set out to do that. When I came here, I was very young and I had lots of life lessons to put under my belt. And so when I say everything that I learned, I learned here at MSU and from the Beatles, I'm not exaggerating. Let me tell you four of the lessons I learned while I was here on campus. The first one is zip it, listen and learn. Zip it, listen and learn. When I was going to elementary school, I had a report card very much like the report card of other little girls who were in elementary school, and it said three tragic words. Talks too much. Talks too much. But I had a next door neighbor named Mr. Rogers, and I'm not talking about the man that wore the It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Not that guy. But Mr. Rogers, Fletcher W. Rogers, taught me a little poem that went something like this. It's better to whine than to cry. It's better to whistle than whine. But it's best to be silent if you have nothing to say. <laughs> so using that little poem, I began to listen more than talk. Now, I'm the quiet one of my family, and y'all are thinking, oh yeah, right, because you're just going on and on. But I really am a very quiet person. My sister is the outgoing one. 
She's the one that calls our elderly aunts and checks on them. When she walks into church, everybody goes, Lisa! And they all run up and hug her. And she's the one that the kids all gather around. She's a great mother and a great teacher. And if I were going to write a poster about how to be a good person, I would write, be like Lisa. But if you're going to be a writer, you have to zip it, listen, and learn. I want to show you something in my little bag of tricks. These are just a few of the notebooks that I carry, oops, that I carry in my purse. And here's another one, and here's yet another one. I bet I have 12 of these scattered in various purses. And the reason I carry them is when I go into a restaurant, or I go to a party, or I'm in a gathering like this, I don't say very much, but I listen to you talk, and I listen to the words that you use. And I watch your expressions and the way you're crossing your arm and the way you chew your gum and the way you smile. And there you go, and you have one too. And I write it down. And you'll show up in the pages of my book because my teachers here at Northwestern taught me to look for the most used, the best word. And I'm always looking for expressions that I can use. I want to show you one other thing. This is what the, the back of my novels look like. When I'm reading a book, I always buy them because that's what they look like. Because I write down great expressions. Now, I'm not going to steal anybody's expression. But I change it and I alter it when I see something. Let's see if I can find one. And then I write, okay to use. I have put this in my words. Okay, I wrote down in this one, John's voice was determined, cold. Okay, I must have seen a sentence in this book that was structured in that way, and it sparked that idea to write that sentence. So when I'm finished with this novel, I'll type it up, and I'll have a list of expressions to use in the next book. I'm always working, looking for that remote use. Where did I learn that? Here at MSU. Well, John did that too. Some of you know the story of the Beatles. How many of you really know the Beatles? Okay, good deal. So you know that in 1957, John formed his first band. His mother, Julia, had convinced him that he had music in his bones. She used to play a banjo and sing in the pubs across Liverpool. And his father sang on the transport ships that took the troops to Europe during World War II. He would sing, when they begin, the begin. And people loved it. They thought it was fascinating, Fred Lennon. So John was convinced that he had music in his bones, and he formed a band, and he named it the Before the Silver Beagles, who were they? The Quarrymen. And the reason that he named it the Quarrymen was because his high school was Quarrymen Grammar. The high school is called Grammar. And he felt if he named it after the high school, they would feel indebted to ask him to play for the school dances. So the Quarrymen. And... Um, you think I hear John out there right now? <laughs> and when he formed this band, he realized that in order to become great, he couldn't rely on himself. He had to start studying other people and following them and finding out what worked and what didn't. So in the first book that I wrote about John, this is his life from 1940 to 1961. And at the end of this book, the Beatles get a manager. They're getting ready to leave Liverpool behind. They're getting ready to step onto the world stage. But we're going to look at him for just a moment at age 16. This is the 2nd of June, 1957. He's just had this band for a few months, and he's realizing that to get to the top, he has to work at it. He has to search for the Lomos used. This is what it says. John was learning rapidly. While appearing to muddle about, he was observing, reacting, adapting. Every time his mother played a rock and roll number on her record player, John listened intently. Every time the radio Luxembourg, or Luxie as he called it, offered up faded moments of tutti fruity or giddy up a ding dong, John lunged for his guitar and strained to memorize what he heard. The energy that other students reserve for academics or athletics, John expended on music. He played his treasured 78 RPM of Rock Island line endlessly until it scratched more than it sang. 
Then he sold it for two shillings sixpence, ready cash for more music. John stalked Quarry Bank students such as Mike Hill, who had extensive collections of American rock and roll, hounding them for after school listening sessions. John became his new guitar's slender shadow. In fact, he was rarely seen without the instrument over his shoulder, the strap rumbling his disheveled quarry bank blazer. Like a ruffled crow with a precious morsel tucked jealously under his wing, John flew awkwardly through all other experiences, bird's eye focused on music and rock and roll, oblivious to the bigger world around him. He was doing exactly what we all need to do if we want to excel in the thing that you love. Zip it, listen, and learn. I had some great, great, great professors when I was here at NSU. Walter Mosley, who was the head of the English department and taught me creative writing. Dr. Poe, we've already talked about. Mrs. Fletcher, Mrs. Neeson, I could go on and on. But I want to tell you about one guy. His name was Joe Johnson. I don't know how do any of you know Joe Johnson. He was what we call a portly man. He had a red beard and he had a corkscrew cane, you know, those canes that had the knob in. He taught me, I took every class that I could take with him, but the first class that I took with Joe Johnson was Shakespeare's Tragedies. It started at 10 a.m. in the morning. At 10 a.m. we were gathered, waiting. No Joe Johnson, 10.02.1. No Joe Johnson, 10.02. No Joe Johnson, 10.03. Clack. Clack, clack, clack. The door swung open and in he walked. He looked at us with fiery eyes and he said, unendurable and inescapable. Unendurable and inescapable. That is the definition of tragedy. I never forgot that. And I want to read for you the opening lines of Should Have Been There. John's mother, Julia, is having a baby. It's the 9th of October, 1940. She's by herself because her husband is away at war, and Julia Lennon is having John. Unendurable and inescapable. Some professor, undoubtedly referring to something tragic and Shakespearean, had said it once. Julia couldn't remember who. Unendurable and inescapable. Unendurable and inescapable. The blinding, gut-wrenching pain tore at her body, and as her mind wandered through bizarre, jumbled catalogs, Julia remembered some mythological creature springing full grown from his father's head. Any minute now, she would burst open. She couldn't hold on much longer. She thought if somehow she could leave this place, the pain would subside but tubes and bottles, needles and machines tethered her and there was no one to help her escape. No one. Julia was blind. The words of Joe Johnson, with full credit of course, opened my first book. My teachers here at NSU taught me so much. If only I would zip it, listen, and learn. Second thing that I learned here at NSU, I wish I could take credit for, but the words were, are found in this wonderful book called Creating a Charmed Life by a friend of mine named Victoria Moran. Um, if you don't have this book or you're not familiar with it, you need to read it. There are snippets, you can read it in five minutes each day or three minutes each day. But they're just, they're great little life lessons. And one that I especially love says, life is too short to drink bad coffee. This is my favorite coffee. It's Folgers Gourmet. This one is the chocolate truffle, but my favorite one is vanilla biscotti. And I want to tell you what, Mother and I were talking about the price of coffee the other day, and she said, if it gets much higher, I'm just not going to buy it anymore. Well, not me, brother. I'm going to be buying a coffee because life is too short not to drink coffee, and life is too short not to drink good coffee. When I was at Northwestern, uh, I was dating a young man on campus who shared common interests with me. We were both history majors. Uh, we both were, loved English. We liked to go out to dinner. We liked to go to movies. 
But that was about the extent of the par excellence. He was kind of community coffee. All right, if you, you like community coffee, he was like low grade filters. And I thought, I'm just going to have to settle for this because this is the best that I can get. And, you know, we like, we like sort of the same things, so I'm just going to go with it. Well, let me tell you something. You don't have to settle for ordinary coffee. I was very blessed. I went to the, okay, you're going to laugh, so I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I was the Louisiana soybean queen. And I was lucky enough to go to the Washington, D.C. Mardi Gras Ball, where all the commodity queens go for the senators and representatives who can't come back to Louisiana. And at that Mardi Gras Ball, I met a midshipman who was my escort for the evening. And I knew within 10 minutes that he was really good coffee. And we had been married for 35 years. It's my husband, Rand. Yeah, Rand. And we have had some really, really wonderful, happy, blessed years and some really hard, difficult, tragic years. And how can you go through a tragedy with bad coffee? How can you take the hard times if you have picked less than the best? So wherever you are today, if I could give one word of advice to students, it's don't settle go for the best because in 35 years that we've been married, I haven't had one sip of bad coffee. So thank you very much. John Lennon believed in going for the best. That lesson that I learned at NSU, well, he knew it too. And he made his group repeat this mantra. He would make them say over and over, you know what I'm going to say, where are we going, lads? And they would say, to the toppermost, Johnny. And where is that? To the toppermost of the poppermost, Johnny. And he made them say it so many times they just wanted to throw up. But he wanted to ingrain in them that they were going to be bigger than Elvis. They were going to get to the top, no matter how hard that top was to achieve. You don't have to drink bad coffee. You can go for the best. Let me tell you a little story about the band that almost wasn't. In December of 1961, the Beatles came home from Hamburg. We were talking about this at lunch today. Their parents had left. John was 19. Paul was 18. George was just turning 17. And their parents let these kids go away to the red light district of Hamburg, Germany, and play in clubs for three months. And when they got there, they were shown to their living quarters. And I see you nodding, so you know where they live, don't you? They took them to the Bambi Kino movie theater, and behind the screen, there was an 8x8 eight eight concrete cubicle with no windows and some cots and a blanket folded on each cot, and they said, this is where you'll be sleeping. And I, I, we're going to be sleeping in a movie theater during the day when they're showing the movie because they played rock and roll all night long. And we're going to be sleeping behind the screen. Yes, that's right. Uh, okay, where do we wash up? Come with me. And they walked down the hall, and there was the lavatory for the movie theater. And there was a toilet and a sink. And the sink, joy oh joy, had cold water. No hot water. For three months, that's where they showered. That's where they cleaned up in a sink with cold water in a movie theater behind the screen. Now, when they got back to Liverpool, Paul unpacked his bags as quickly as he could and he enrolled in school. He went back to Liverpool Institute to become a teacher because he said, heck with that, I'm never doing that again. George unpacked his bag and he got a job as an electrician's mate and said, that John Lennon is crazy. I'm going to get a job where I make some good money. And Pete Best, their drummer, unpacked his bag and went to work in his mother's team club. And John went door to door, knocking on the doors pulling his band back together again. And he said to them, what are you thinking? Because you are going to the toppermost of the poppermost. You are going to be bigger than Elvis. You're not going to settle for bad coffee. You're going to the top. Come back to the band because we're going to be famous. And look what happened. They were. They were. Third lesson that I learned at NSU, I learned in a class called Social Usage. Have you ever heard of that? 
social usage. It was a class of etiquette and manners. I heard that the teacher was an excellent instructor. Everyone said that she was fantastic. And I got to take an elective, so that's the class I chose. In the back of my mind, I think I thought that maybe I could get a good grade in the class because the professor also happened to be my mother, <laughs> Mrs. Sutherland, right here. But let me tell you what, if anything, Mrs. Sutherland graded harder on this student than every other student in the class, and there was no easy A in that class. But one of the maxims that she taught us in that class was how to, with decorum and with polish and with responsibility, break a huge task into manageable components. What she taught us was, and I quote, you can eat an elephant if you do it one bite at a time. You can eat an elephant if you do it one bite at a time. And I remember that all my life. The Beatles certainly encountered that maxim. On the 11th of February, 1963, the Beatles went to the recording studio to record not a song, not two songs, not four songs, but what? 11th of February, 63, their first album, the whole album, the whole thing. Now, we were right, Carrie took a whole year to record her CD. People take six months to make a CD. They take weeks to make an album. The Beatles were given 12 hours. At 6 a.m. that morning, they rousted those boys out of bed. They had played a gig until 2 the night before, so they had four hours of sleep. And they said, get up, get up, get up, get up. You're going to have a photo session. Right now, up, 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 look good. You're going for a photo session. From 6 until 10, they had their photos made. At 10 a.m., they were in the recording studio, and they had until 10 that night to record 14 of the most famous songs in history. Twist and Shout. Please, please me. Love me do. Uh, Baby, it's you. Lots of great cover songs like Anna. All in one day. And guess what, guys? They were sick. They had flu. John's voice was so bad that every time he would drink out of the milk carton to soothe his throat, the milk would turn pink from the blood. They didn't record the songs one time. They would record them seven times, 13 times, 11 times. And by the end of the day, John's voice was shot and they were going to ask him to record the night's final song. We'll come back to that in just a moment and I'm gonna give you a glimpse of what happened. But think about what they had to do that day. They had to eat that elephant one bite at a time, one parcel at a time. And that's what I learned to do. Um, on the 11th of February, 63, they faced an impossible task. And you know, there were a lot of times here at NSU, you probably feel it too, when I felt like I was facing an impossible task. Taking 177 hours in only three years. I took 23 hours every semester, and in the summer I took, what? Yeah, and I took, and I took 15 hours every summer. And I was able to do it, but there were many times when I just felt like I really couldn't go on. Um, Dr. Poe, the, the instructor that we talked about before, required that you read 50 books every semester in this class. And that was one of my classes. So there were many times when I had to rely upon the fact that if you eat the elephant, you do it one bite at a time, you're going to succeed. But it gave me the discipline that I needed in order to complete the second book on John, which came out about a year ago. It's called Shivering Inside, and it covers John's life from 1961 to 1963. It takes him through the rise to British fame, the years in which they became very, very popular. Now, in, his, in the earlier book, I only had about 30 books that were written about his childhood. So the research wasn't so daunting, but in this one, it's very common for me to have 60 books for every single chapter to do research in, and there are 932 footnotes in this book. I was able to get the transcripts from Abbey Road to write their dialogue, so the words that they're saying are the actual words that they said in the studio because the tape was running and you have their actual words. 
But that kind of research, it took me five years to do this, and to do this kind of research, I had to have a belief that you could eat that elephant if you do it one bite at a time. And so I want to thank my mother and my social usage teacher for teaching me that very important lesson because it really has paid off. So thank you very much. Y'all give her a hand. The last lesson that I learned here on campus came from my dean. And my, the dean of education, at that time, later became the vice president of Northwestern, taught me actually two lessons. Um, and the first one is that um, a job worth doing is worth doing well. And the second one is that a quitter never wins and a winner never quits. And the dean of education and later the vice president uh, was, was and is my father, Dr. Tom Paul Sutherland. Um, let's talk first about a job worth doing is worth doing well. It took me 20 years to write this first book on John's life. And as I look around the room tonight, I see people who know the Beatles, really know the Beatles. And there are people out there who know every date, every fact, every second of the Beatles' lives. You can't bull these people. You can't just make up something and put it in the book. You better have it right. And if you make more than a couple mistakes, you lose your credibility. There's a brilliant man named Bob Spitz who wrote a book about John Lennon. And the poor man made maybe 13 errors in his book. Guys, they ridicule him. They laugh at him. They say something like, it's a Spitz book. I mean, he made 13 errors and nobody believes a word he says because of those errors. I knew this had to be right. People would say to me, just push print. But my father had taught me that a job worth doing is worth doing well. So I fact-checked it over and over and over and over. And finally, when I pushed print, I knew that it was going to be right. Um, John felt the same way. And we're going to return to that night in 1963 that I told you about when they had been recording all day long and now they came to record the final song of the evening. As I told you, John's throat was raw and the milk had been turning red and was bleeding in his throat. They had already recorded 13 songs and they had turned the lights down in the recording studio and gone to the canteen to have a cup of coffee and a few biscuits. And they wanted to record the final song, something that would make that album, they didn't call them albums in those days because an album is something that an art student put together. Uh, they call them LPs, long playing records. They never would have said the word album. But they needed something to close that LP that was brilliant. It would make you go, wow. It would make you want to go buy the next one. And so they're in the canteen talking with George Martin, their producer, about what that final song would be. And I'll let you eavesdrop. So, George Martin took the first cup of coffee with a nod. What do you have that could be recorded expediently, but would also be a showstopper, a final close for the LP? Well, Brian, the manager, offered quietly, glancing at John to make sure he wasn't overstepping his managerial bounds. They do have their final traditional number. Right, Paul nodded, handing Brian a cup of coffee as well. Twist and shout, you know, it's gangbusters as they say in America. But, George protested, that, that's Johnny's number, and he's fagged out. I'll do it, John said, in as few words as possible. You'll, you'll do it. You'll sing, twist and shout, George Martin is incredulous. John nodded, down in the cold milk. But, it's... Daunting, Brian objected. Even when you're 100%, it's, it's too much. He said he'll do it, Paul spared John the banter. And when John's up for it, John's up for it. George Martin had dreamed of producing an LP that would let the rest of England and possibly someday the world know what these four unusual Liverpool boys were like. This was the sound he had hoped to elicit. This unvarnished, uncensored magic that made Brian Epstein's group something special. 
Something special, George thought, as he listened to John rasp out the song. Even to himself, that phrase sounded trite and silly. It was a sentiment on a birthday card. It was a line from an anniversary greeting. But listening to the boys below him build up their I'll do you one better ah all the way up. Listening to John's rock and roll scream, there was no other way to describe them. Brian Epstein, too, was staggered, overwhelmed, as the last note died away and Paul's final, hey, reverberated. Brian's eyes were riveted on the boys below. What the hell do you think of that? Norman Smith shouted to the others. John absolutely screamed it, George Martin said. Well, boys, Martin showered down his approval on the band. We needed that linen ripping sound, if you'll pardon the pun, and we certainly got it well done. Excellent job all. But John was far from pleased. In fact, he was bitterly ashamed. He knew he could do better, had done better hundreds of times. It was humiliating to offer this up as the best he could conjure. It was shite. We'll give it another try, John mumbled, and all eyes turned to him stunned. I mean, it's his head collab. It's, he could feel the looks of astonishment. They had all done their best to make this work the first time through, and now it was the Mimi in John who pushed for that second take, the never pleased, never good enough slice of his nature that sought for perfection. John believed that a job worth doing was worth doing well. He despised second best. And there you have it. Life lesson number one, learned from my dean, my father. Life lesson number two, a quitter never wins and a winner never quits. I don't know if any of you know my father, but he has macular degeneration. Um, it's a disease that causes you to lose your central vision. You can see a little bit with your peripheral vision, but if you'll right now take your hands and do this, Go ahead, try it. That's what you see. That's macular degeneration. With that as a quote unquote handicap, he goes by himself lots of places. We were in somewhere the other night. He said, I'm going to the restroom. And I said, do you want me to go with you? And he said, no, I'll find it. No. And went off on his own. He mows the yard. He plays golf. He watched the yay, Alabama, LSU, or should I say LSU, Alabama game on television the other night. We watched a movie the other night. He does not let that stop him. He has taught me that a quitter never wins and a winner never quits, not just by saying it, which believe me, he said it plenty of times, but he has taught it by living it, living that example. And John lived that example as well. I told you about rounding his band up. I told you about living in the bandy keynote, living in an eight by eight concrete Listen, guys, the Beatles were turned down by more people than you could ever imagine. More doors were shut. When they tried to go back to Hamburg the second time, no bank would finance them. They heard the word no more than any other group you could ever imagine, and they never let that stop them. John never quit believing that they could get to the toppermost of the toppermost, that they could be bigger than Elvis. I want to share one last bit with you tonight. But if you don't mind, I'm going to sit right here. And I know my Liverpool accent isn't so good, so just bear with me. You have to, as, as they say in our English classes, you have to suspend disbelief. Do they still talk about that? A, um, a moment in John's life in which he was talking to his friend um, Stu Sutcliffe. Do you guys know about Stu? Stu was the first bass player of the Beatles long before Paul McCartney took it up. Um, he was John's best friend, his soulmate. John's mother, some of you know, relinquished John at age four and for very complicated reasons, and his father at age five. And when I say the book is should have been there, it's not because you should have been there for the Beatles or the 60s, but everybody who should have been there for John was not. He had a very sad and tragic life. Stu Sutcliffe, his best friend in college, was there for John. 
John was a mean guy sometimes because if he could wound you first and, and get to you first and you still liked him, then you were really his friend. When I went to Quarry Bank Grammar and I interviewed one of the people there who was the head boy when John was in school or the prefect who was responsible for giving John his punishments, he said to me as his only comment, John was assault. And he said, by that I don't mean salt of the earth. I mean he was a salt and an open wound. He, he knew what, where you were vulnerable, and he would hit you with it, and he would say the nastiest things he could say to you to try to get you to walk away from it. And if you didn't walk away, and if you liked him, and if you talked to him, then you were his friend for life. Stu knew. Stu knew what John was like. He knew it was mean. He knew that he could make jokes about the worst things, and he still loved it. And Stu and John are sitting on the steps of Gambier Terrace, which was their apartment in college. And they're sitting up high, looking down toward the docks of Liverpool. It's dusk, and the lights were just starting to come on. Over to the right, the Anglican Cathedral is being built. If you go to Liverpool today, you'll see the Anglican Cathedral. It is the second largest cathedral in the world, except for the Vatican in Rome. To tell you that it's huge, I have no words. I don't even have the mots used to describe the Anglican Cathedral. It's breathtaking. And it's being constructed right here. The boys are sitting, smoking their fags, their cigarettes, and they're looking down the hill as the lights are starting to come on. And they're talking about the future and what the future is going to hold. And let's see what they had to say. They sat on the crumbling concrete steps outside Stu's new flat in Gambier Terrace and watched the sun drop against the steel scaffolding of the Anglican Cathedral. Their cigarette butts glowed in the amber darkness. A rattle-trap taxi grinded its gears and spun towards the docks. Otherwise, the street was unusually quiet. Hey, John. Stu's voice was diminished by the immensity of the sunset and the long view of the Mersey River down below. How long will it be, do you think? Spit it out, saw it clear. John exhaled smoke so and slowly. He let the aroma and the silence linger. How long will it be, John? How long do you think? Until we've made it big. Till we're bigger than Elvis? John used his favorite catchphrase. Yeah, that. Stu leaned back against the cracked concrete landing and plucked at a determined weed growing through a fissure. How long will it be, would you say? Sometimes, John tossed the last stub of his cig on the sidewalk. Sometimes I'm convinced I'm a raven madman, obsessed with a dream of fame and fortune that'll never actually happen. That I'm living a fantasy, as it were, every Liverpool son's dream of escaping to the world outside. But then, John Hartley moved. Sometimes the vision's so real I can almost touch it, can almost feel it coming about. He leaned forward, his elbows on his knees. As strange as it seems in the light of day, and as mad as it sounds to anyone else to, I believe I've got this fate, this kismet, what have you, this predestination to make it big. Stu watched the streetlights ignite, dotting the sunset sky. He drew on his cig and listened. There's nights, Stu, John went on, when I fall asleep listening to rock and roll. And somehow it becomes my rock and roll, not Roy Orbison's, not Gene Vincent's, not Cliff Richards, not anyone else's. It's me I hear performing. And I'm great, I'm famous, the conquering hero, what have you. I'm up there. And I'm up there for no other reason than I'm just made up my mind to be there, you know. Yeah, right. I believe it. Stu gestured towards the world beyond the Mersey River, beyond the Wirral Peninsula, even beyond the Irish Sea. I believe you, John. I know you'll be out there with Elvis, Buddy Holly, and Chuck Berry, and all the rest of them someday. And you'll be there as well, Sutcliffe, the two of us. Right, John, the artist and the poet. No, the rocker and the painter. Get the order right, son, John said. Well, John, 
What do you say we drink to that then, before we're too famous to frequent the Liverpool pubs? Yeah, John hoisted himself up and then gave Stu a hand. Carpe diem and all that crap. And pulling their coats around them, the two dream spinners set out towards Rice Street, each telling the other the most incredible tales and believing in a holy quest whose ramifications neither of them fully understood. John was determined to be the best, toppermost of the toppermost. His jobs had to be well done, and he knew that a quitter never wins and a winner never quits. The life lessons that I learned, my quest started here at Northwestern State University. You so prepared me and gave me such a rich heritage to draw from in order to spend 20 years writing this book, five writing Shivering Inside, and working on the third book right now, She Loves You, which will be The Conquest of America, The Beatles Coming to America. And it's going to continue all the way through John's life. Uh, his solo years, the peace movement, the years with Yoko, the years with May Pang. May Pang has just agreed very graciously not only to give me a week-long interview, but to write the foreword for the book where, that she will be uh, featured in. Larry Kane, who traveled with the Beatles in 1964, was the journalist who traveled with them, is writing the foreword for She Loves You and sharing his experiences. So many people have helped. But the basics that I got here have been what helped me to be successful with these books. And I thank Northwestern for that. It's been a great honor to say that my alma mater is an issue. Thank you so much.
didn't have you. I wanted you. You didn't want me. I mean, it's a sad song, you know, about how he, he sang, sang a song for his mother called Julia, and he says, half of what I say is meaningless, but I say it just to reach you, Julia. Julia's the girl in every song, whether it's you got to hide your love away or help or nowhere man, they're all about her. So I wanted to tell that story, you know, that, that parents mattered and that those people should have been there. Thank you so much, guys. It's just great. I really appreciate everybody coming out and being here. And, uh, I do have books. Um, I'll be glad to sign them for you. Christmas present. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, where the clue says the ultimate degree. Now, 
know the fact that you mentioned it's the PhD. <laughs> and certainly that is the ultimate in academia. On the other hand, the correct answer to that clue is the nth degree. Because when someone does something to the nth degree, they go above and beyond the normal call of duty. They go up above and beyond what we consider to be normal achievement, the overachievement. And on occasion, Northwestern honors by conferring upon selected people what we call the nth degree from Northwestern. It means a lot to us. We hope it means a lot to those who earn this distinction. And Judy is one of those people that we so honored to see. So I want to congratulate you and tell you how proud we are of you. Thank you so much. 